Escape Pod, Episode 747. Flash from the Vault. Hi there, and welcome to the third and final term of Escape Pod Summer School, where we post some of our favorite flash fiction from the vault with a new perspective. I'm Divya, co-editor of the pod and your instructor for this class. This episode also concludes our summer flashback series. We'll be back next week with the best in original and reprint science fiction. Today, I bring you three flash episodes from long, long ago. First up is Standards by Richard K. Lyon. Then we have Paradox by Scott Jansons. And finally, Stuck in an Elevator with Mandy Patinkin by Kitty Myers. Our first author, Richard K. Lyon, was by profession a semi-retired research scientist in chemical kinetics applied to air pollution problems. By avocation, he was a second-generation science fiction fan and first-generation writer, On his own, he sold quite a few stories to Analog and other magazines. With Andy Offit, he did three Tiana books and a novel that was serialized in Analog called Rails Across the Galaxy. Your narrator, Frank Key, was a British writer, blogger, and broadcaster best known for his self-published short story collections and his long-running radio series Hooting Yard on the Air, which was broadcast weekly on Resonance FM from April 2004 to September 2019, when he passed away. Frank co-founded the Malice of Forethought Press with Max Descharnay and published the fiction of Ellis Sharp. Now, get ready to visit 2008, because it's story time. Standards by Richard K. Lyon Review of Physics, National Institute for Advanced Study, 1177 16th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. April 1st, 1934. Mr. John Armstrong, care of the Harvard Club, 27 West 44th Street, New York, New York, 10017. Dear Mr. Armstrong, After careful examination of your manuscript number 113785, Corbamite, an insulator against gravity, the editors of Review of Physics have concluded that it is not suitable for publication in this journal. This decision is final and further correspondence on this subject will serve no useful purpose. Since the above may seem somewhat harsh, let me say what I can to mitigate it. The editors do appreciate that you're working under difficult circumstances. When the senior author of a paper is deceased, it is always hard for the junior author to complete the work in an appropriate manner. Also, let us assure you that we do believe you. You have told us that with his dying breath, Professor Steinhardt handed you his notebook and said, "'Have this published in Review of Physics.' Such an action would be completely in character for Steinhardt, since he was a true scientist. As for your claim that Professor Steinhardt made this statement as he was expiring from disintegrator rays wounds suffered during your escape from the city of disembodied brains on Altair IV, our believing that is a somewhat different matter, but we need to go into that. What is important is that you should recognise that whatever the highly emotional circumstances of Professor Steinhardt's passing may have been, they have no relevance to publication in Review of Physics. The sole criterion for publication in this journal is the comments of the referees. In your case, these comments were highly negative, and I must add that I completely agree. Your paper claims the existence of a substance which insulates against gravity, this being the basis of the ether flyer by which you and the late Professor Steinhardt voyaged to Altair IV. Such a substance, however, completely violates elementary potential theory, and, if it could exist at all, would have to be totally different from what you envision. 
Since, Mr Armstrong, you profess yourself to be a man of action, I'm not surprised that you find the above difficult to comprehend. If I may make a suggestion, perhaps you should study any good text in freshman physics. Furthermore, while I can readily understand why you wish to visit the referees and personally demonstrate your anti-gravity apparatus to them, I cannot reveal their identities to you. Referees are anonymous by long-standing tradition, one purpose of this tradition being to prevent acrimonious confrontations of the very kind you seek. Finally, I must tell you that your continued visits to the offices of Review of Physics are contraproductive. As you know, we're located on the 20th floor, and your floating in and out through our windows is a considerable distraction to the clerical staff. Sincerely yours, Oscar C. Tonys, Editor-in-Chief. And that's our story. By coincidence, the author died shortly before this story was published, which I thought made it particularly poignant in spite of its satirical tone and I discovered upon looking up the narrator that he passed away last September. I decided to make this the opening story of my three as a testament to the longevity of Escape Pod. I also like the way it points out a common fallacy among academics, especially scientists. I was raised by a college professor who prizes rational thought, and I was a huge fan of the book Dune as a teenager. I bought into the whole be super unemotional and logical way of the Bene Gesserit as something to aspire to. It took having a child to realize that sometimes it's better to lead with emotion, at least the good ones, like empathy and compassion. And it took a couple decades of adult life to realize there's no way to make a personal decision without some degree of emotional involvement. You can make pros and cons lists all day long, But in the end, it boils down to what you want. All of which is a roundabout way of saying that we can never truly separate our desires from facts. The most rational academics and scientists will struggle to let go of their cherished beliefs even if the contradictory evidence is right in front of their eyes. Our next story is Paradox by Scott Janssens. At the time the story was written, back in 2005, Scott lived in Seattle and wrote code for a large software company. Your narrator, Paul S. Jenkins, is a fiction author, podcaster, occasional narrator, and skeptic blogger. Paradox by Scott Janssens I saw nothing when I looked through the eyepiece Franz handed me, and told him so. Of course not, said Franz. Right now, the time site is set to look into the future. From this point in time, the future doesn't exist yet, not in any meaningful way, so it can't be seen. He twisted a ring on the sight and bade me look again. Through it, I saw Franz welcome me at the outer door to his laboratory. Outside, the London fog created yellow halos around the gas lamps along the lane. I watched Franz take my coat and top hat and hang them on hooks beside the door. Then my own image grew as it approached where I currently stood, by the fireplace. Extraordinary, I said. How far back can this device see? Nearly a thousand years at the moment. Theoretically, given enough electrical charge, we could see creation. Amazing! So you've given up on travelling through time in favour of seeing through it? Not at all. The sight is the final piece to my time seat. I asked you here tonight to witness man's first trip through time. I scoffed. Light is one thing, but surely you can't move physical objects through time. It's really quite simple. I'm surprised it wasn't done decades ago. But if time travel is possible, I argued, then why have we never encountered men from the future? Why, I'd expect this room to be packed with spectators from the future, waiting to see the first time journey. Nonsense. There is nothing to be gained by witnessing this event, not compared to all the forgotten knowledge to be rediscovered. Rest assured, With your record, the future will remember Franz Varga. He took the time sight from me and fitted it into an apparatus mounted onto the left arm of what used to be a common parlour chair. He seated himself in the chair and made an adjustment to the sight. Then he fiddled with some levers protruding from a box mounted to the underside. Don't you think you're being a little hasty? I asked. 
I don't need to remind you of the cloud chamber incident. He waved me off impatiently. There is no time to waste if I'm to make a time voyage before Mackenzie does. At that point I knew he would not be dissuaded, not where his chief rival was involved. Where are you going? I asked. Just a test run, he assured me. A hundred years is a nice round number. I plan to bring back a newspaper as proof of my journey. I need you to note the precise time of my departure and return. To an observer here, I should appear to be gone only a few seconds. I removed my pocket watch from my waistcoat. I synchronized it with Franz's pendulum clock and nodded my readiness. Franz arranged himself in the time seat, straightened his coat, and took one last peek through the time sight before turning a dial on the right armrest I hadn't previously noticed. On that night, Franz Varga embarked on man's first trip through time when he vanished with his time seat. When he didn't return after thirty seconds or so, I began to worry. He said he'd be away only a few seconds. Surely he meant minutes, I consoled myself, while keeping an eye on my watch. After several minutes had passed, it came to me why he couldn't return. I imagined Franz looking into his dark time sight. From his point in time, the future didn't exist yet. Not in any meaningful way. And that's our story. Curiosity is a formidable force of human nature. It's driven much of human technological and scientific progress, and it starts right from birth. We're built to be curious about our world, to experiment with it, whether it's tasting every object that we grasp or dropping our peas on the ground over and over to observe how they fall. As with most qualities, the degree of curiosity we contain varies from person to person, and while it seems to fall off with age, on average, some of us seem to retain it for life. Unfortunately, the burning desire to experiment and understand the world around us comes with a downside, the risk of hurting oneself. Curiosity doesn't just kill cats. Scientists who like to be the first to try out their new discoveries or inventions are not the exclusive domain of fiction. Jonas Salk gave himself and his children the polio vaccine before it was widely tested. More recently, the citizen scientists of RADVAC gave themselves their own version of a COVID vaccine. The Wright brothers, among many others, flung themselves into the sky in hopes of flight. Sometimes these experiments led to Nobel Prizes or life-changing innovations, and sometimes they led to Darwin Awards or getting stuck in the distant past. Our last story is from 2006, Stuck in an Elevator with Mandy Patinkin, by Kitty Myers. Kitty Myers has written a lot of flash fiction. She first published this story in a collection called Briefs and Other Unmentionables. Your narrator is our very own Mer Lafferty. Mer is an American podcaster and writer based in Durham, North Carolina. She is the host and creator of the podcasts I Should Be Writing and Ditch Diggers. Her books have been nominated for the Hugo, Nebula, Philip K. Dick, and Scribe Awards, and she is the winner of the 2013 Astounding Award for Best New Writer. Stuck in an Elevator with Mandy Patinkin by Kitty Myers Aren't you Rube, the Grim Reaper and Dead Like Me? As he turned to look at me, an expression of amusement spread over his face like a wave of sunshine over a cloudy field. I'm not a Grim Reaper in real life, he mimicked, but I do play one on TV. I was stuck in a hotel elevator with the actor Mandy Patinkin. I didn't recognize him until the elevator jerked to a stop between the 11th and 12th floors. It was just the two of us, me, a 20-something single woman having one of the best hair days of my life and wearing my skinniest jeans, and the guy who, upon closer examination, played Rube in Dead Like Me. I bet you get asked that a lot, huh? Not really. Usually they ask if I'm Dr. Geiger, or sometimes they recognize me from Yentl. But you're the first person who's ever asked me if I was the Grim Reaper. Did it make your day? Yes, it did. His laugh, by the way, is charming. We stood there, he on his side of the elevator and me on mine, smiling and waiting and feeling rather awkward, if truth be told. I noticed that he wasn't wearing any shoes or socks. He was wearing a two-piece suit with the shirt pulled out, but no shoes. I wondered if he had been locked out of his room. I wondered if he was even staying at this hotel. 
Maybe he was having an affair with a woman who was staying here and her husband walked in on them. Then he left in such a hurry and he forgot his socks and shoes. Oh, Lord, the silence was beginning to feel even more claustrophobic than the elevator. At least Mandy Patinkin's feet didn't smell. Who's Dr. Geiger? Oh, he was the character I played on Chicago Hope. More awkward silence followed, and then he ventured, Were you a Chicago Hope fan? No, but I don't get a chance to see much television. The only thing I ever saw you in was Dead Like Me. He seemed genuinely surprised. Just that? How about my movies? Did you ever see Yentl? No. How about Secret Garden or The Princess Bride? Nope, just Dead Like Me, which I really miss, by the way. I emphasized the word really because I felt guilty that I hadn't seen more of his work. He periodically checked his watch, so I asked, How long have we been stuck in here? Not quite five minutes. He sighed, ran his hand through his hair, and slid down the corner until he was almost sitting. Normally, I'd remain standing if I were stuck in an elevator alone with a man. But Mandy Patinkin seemed okay, even if he did seem a bit anxious at the moment. So I slid down the opposite corner and sat Indian style. You know, this is probably the best day of my life. I'm stuck in an elevator with the guy who starred in my favorite show. That seemed to brighten him up, and he relaxed. Too bad we didn't have more viewers like you. We'd still be on the air. So you really like the show, huh? What did you like about it? Well, first of all, the idea of benevolent grim reapers, which look like everyday people whose purpose was to guide people into their hereafters. It's comforting to think that at the moment you die, there will be someone right there, just to be with you, you know, so that you're not alone. And it was funny at times, too, like all those toilet seats hanging from the tree. Do you believe in the hereafter? Oh, yeah, heaven and hell. It keeps me on the straight and narrow. You mean you think twice before you do something? Twice, three times, sometimes a lot. Like, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I've never even tried pot. You're joking. You've never tried pot? I thought all young people tried it at least once. Nope, never. I could be the only living soul who's never done drugs of any kind. Just my luck if I get to heaven and they have a special room marked drug-free souls and I'll spend eternity in it wishing I'd toked up just once so I'd have some company in heaven. You never cut loose as a teenager? Well, I was kind of wild there for a while, but it didn't involve drugs. Well, there you go. You'll spend eternity in the room marked wild and drug-free souls. Trust me, you won't be alone. The elevator kind of hiccuped, just once, as though it was about to move. At least they're working on it, he said, gazing up. Can I ask why you aren't wearing any shoes? Boy, when Mandy Patinkin smiles, he's gorgeous. I fell asleep in my clothes and overslept. I dashed out to go to an appointment, and I was in the elevator before I realized I wasn't wearing them. That's kind of what I figured. I could feel the silence bearing down again, so I asked, Do you think there really are Grim Reapers, like in the show? But before he could answer, the elevator jolted to life and began its descent. We looked up and watched the floors tick by with alarming momentum. Eleven, ten, nine, eight plunging faster and faster, never stopping at the lobby. Then right before we hit the garage level, Mandy Patinkin reached over and gently brushed my arm with his hand, as though he were Rube on Dead Like Me, releasing the soul of the person who was just about to die. As we stood up and walked out of the garage, he said, See, I told you you wouldn't be alone. that's our story. Part of what drew me to this one was that I knew nothing about the show it references, Dead Like Me. My main exposure to Mandy Patinkin was as Inigo Montoya in The Princess Bride. Still, I knew what was coming before the end. That wasn't the point, though. We all want to have someone at our side when we take our final breath. And as a fan, having someone you admire be that comforting presence would be a worthy alternative to the ideal, someone you love who loves you back. I also wanted to wrap up the summer with something that captures the fun of Escape Pod. This story probably isn't one we'd run today because there's no sciency aspect to it, but it represents the spirit of the podcast that Murr and I try to hew to even today. It has heart, it has a great voice, and, I hope, 
it made you smile. This ends our three months of summer school. We hope you've discovered some new favorites or dusted off your enjoyment of some old ones. The break is over, the flashbacks are done. Come back next week for this year's Flash Fiction Contest winners. They'll kick off a month of original short stories. Escape Pod is a production of Escape Artists Inc. and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. Don't change it, don't sell it, please do go forth and share it. If you'd like to support Escape Pod, rate or review us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite app. We are 100% audience supported, and we count on your donations to keep the lights on and the servers humming. You can donate via Patreon.com by searching for Escape Artists, or via PayPal through our website, escapepod.org. Patreon subscribers have exclusive merchandise access and can be automatically added to our Discord. Our opening and closing music is by Daikaiju at D-A-I-K-A-I-J-U dot O-R-G. And our closing quotation this week is from Jonathan Saffron Four, who said, August has passed, and yet summer continues by force to grow days. They sprout secretly between the chapters of the year, covertly included between its pages. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy your adventures through time and space. <laughs>